Welcome to the Dakota Live podcast. I'm your host, Robert Morier. The goal of this podcast is to help you better know the people behind investment decisions. We introduce you to chief investment officers, manager research professionals, sales leaders, and other important players in the industry who will help you sell in between the lines and better understand the investment sales ecosystem. If you're not familiar with Dakota and their Dakota Live content, please check out dakota.com to learn more about their services. Uh, before we get started, I need to read a brief disclosure. Uh, this content is provided for informational purposes and should not be relied upon as recommendations or advice about investing in securities. All investments involve risk and may lose money. Dakota does not guarantee the accuracy of any of the information provided by the speaker who is not affiliated with Dakota. Not a solicitation, testimonial, or an endorsement by Dakota or its affiliates. Nothing herein is intended to indicate approval, support, or recommendation of the investment advisor or its supervised persons by Dakota. Today's episode is brought to you by Dakota Marketplace. Are you tired of constantly jumping between multiple databases and channels to find the right investment opportunities? Introducing Dakota Marketplace the comprehensive institutional and intermediary database built by fundraisers for fundraisers. With Dakota Marketplace, you'll have access to all channels and asset classes in one place, saving you time and streamlining your fundraising process. Say goodbye to the frustration of searching through multiple databases and say hello to a seamless and efficient fundraising experience. Sign up now and see the difference Dakota Marketplace can make for you. Visit dakotamarketplace.com today. Well, that out of the way, I am very happy to introduce our audience to Dakota's CEO and founder, Guy Costin. Guy, welcome to the desk. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it's nice it. to have you here. We really appreciate it. Uh, we have a very special guest today who is in from out of town. Joe, very nice to meet you and ha have you on the show. Great. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, I'm happy you were able to be here today. Joe Miranda, partner and global head of digital asset investing at Cambridge Associates. Uh, Joe, welcome to Philadelphia. Thanks very much. Well, uh, you were in Miami last week. I know you've been on the road quite a bit in April and May, so we appreciate you being here and extending your road trip uh, into Philadelphia. So what I'll do for the audience is I'll let them know your background, who you are, where you're from, and then we'll get into the questions. Well, Joe joined Cambridge Associates in 2006 and brings 25 years of investments and alternatives investment experience to his clients. He is a partner and head of digital assets investing, specializing in discovering and diligencing blockchain related funds across all fund formats. He also serves as the head of the firm's San Francisco office. Joe contributes to firm research on alternative assets and portfolios and crypto blockchain more broadly. Uh, Joe built the first crypto blockchain portfolio for a Cambridge client beginning in 2018 and completed the firm's first due diligence on a crypto fund in 2017. For those of you unfamiliar with Cambridge Associates, Cambridge is a privately held investment firm providing advisory and investment solutions to institutional investors, including foundations and endowments pensions, private and corporate, and government entities. Founded nearly 50 years ago, the firm has 11 offices, we've counted, 11 offices around the world, with well over $500 billion in assets under advisement. Prior to joining Cambridge Associates, Joe served as a senior analyst at a family office. Previously, he was a turnaround CEO at Kazan, a Tokyo-based tech company focused on the Japanese public markets. Uh, prior to Kazan, Joe was with a family office, investing in special situations in venture capital. Joe is a graduate of the University of Southern California with a degree in East Asian languages and cultures. He followed his BA with a master's degree in East Asian studies from Yale. And finally, he received his MBA from the University of Virginia. Guy, his Let's undergraduate <laughs> at Darden School of Business. So congratulations. Thank you for joining us and really congratulations on all your success. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, so I, I wanted to ask you, just because you spent a lot of time in Asia and you, you do speak Japanese, what was more difficult to learn Japanese or blockchain te technology? Uh, honestly, blockchain tech. Okay. Yeah. Japanese has two alphabets plus the characters and lots of honorifics. Uh, but blockchain is a lot more complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. So for any, all of my undergraduates at Drexel University. Yeah. Take classical Japanese take first classical and Japanese. then figure out uh, blockchain I, later. Yeah. All right. I'll let yeah. the students know right yeah. away. Yeah. Um, well, you, you've been with Cambridge going on 18 years now. So again, congratulations. The, the majority of which were on the hedge fund side of the practice. So what took you to Cambridge originally? You, you were in Asia, obviously studying East Asian culture and languages. Yeah. Um, so so what took you on your path to, to Cambridge Associates? Yeah. Well, the Asia outcome was more a result of having studied a lot of Asia, uh, Asian uh, cultures and languages when I was an undergrad. And then I thought I wanted to get a PhD. Turns out I only wanted to get a master's. Uh, and uh, then like, what do you do with two liberal arts degrees? So I, I actually worked with a, a company that did a lot of US-Japan technology transfer back in the, the early 90s. Uh, and that actually was part of the formative uh, reason why I understand 
and got crypto and blockchain tech so quickly because we worked with a lot of uh, the early pioneers uh, in Unix and Linux. And uh, we also worked with some early distributed database tech and some collaborative software technologies. And that basically led me to you know this company called Kzone, uh, which at the time we didn't know we'd done it, but we gamified investing. Uh, and that was a huge step in Japan because if, if in the United States, we deregulated our financial markets in the 80s and then the internet happened roughly a decade later. In Japan, it all happened at exactly the same time. So uh, you had all these people who suddenly could trade stocks individually, but they had no idea what to do. And so we created uh, basically investment games. Uh, and this allowed people to sort of learn how to trade stocks. And we traded, created a cell phone trading interface back when you had like, you know, nine, nine keys kind of thing. Uh, and so we created a whole generation of investors, mainly through gamification of investing. We just didn't know we gamified investing at the time because that term hadn't been invented till much later. Uh, and that really was the beginning of sort of this whole progression actually in blockchain. But it also is what led to Cambridge because in 2001, you know, sort of the internet blew up uh, and uh, things got pretty slow in what I was doing. And um, I'd gone to a family office and just by chance, a colleague of mine uh, now at Cambridge was a co-classmate at Darden and he'd gone in 1995. Um, and he just said, what a great place Cambridge was to work. And he, we just started talking. And the next thing I know, I'm working at Cambridge Associates. So. In the California office? In the California office. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Is there alternatives and hedge funds for 16 of those years. So did you go right into the alt side of the business? Yes, right into hedge funds. Yeah. Was that because of the family office background? Yes. Great. And were there certain ties that you saw going into? I mean, 16 years in hedge funds, particularly over the last 18 to 20 years, has been has seen some significant changes. So what were you coming into and kind of what did you develop over time as you saw the practice? and then through the practice? Uh, you know, I, the hedge funds have gone through like two iterations really in those 16 years from about 2006 when I joined to about 2012. Everybody wanted to be invested in hedge funds. Like returns were amazing. Alpha was great. They protected in the global financial crisis. Uh, and during that time, you know, institutional investors were taking hedge fund allocations from probably like a fund of funds all the way up through maybe 25% of the portfolio, sometimes even 30% and having large diversified hedge fund portfolios. And then interest rates went to zero and suddenly alpha became a lot harder to find. All the arbitrage strategies, you know, you didn't get paid for shorting uh, on the, either the arbitrage side or being in long short because the short rebate was zero. Uh, so you really had to be good at your shorting. Um, otherwise, it was very expensive. Uh, and uh, hedge fund returns, you know, s slowed down along with uh, risk assets being rewarded. So long only venture capital, private equity, those did incredibly well during this period. So, you know, it's great if you have a diversified portfolio because, you know, one thing it does poorly, one thing does great. And hedge funds weren't doing poorly, they just weren't nearly as exciting as long only in venture. Um, and so that was largely, that largely defined like the last decade of hedge funds, which was, you know, zero percentage rates, easy money, financial repression. Uh, and that really, I think, was one of the, the fundamental things that crushed uh, hedge fund returns and that in the you know, no short re short rebate. Um, but um, even though I'm no longer really deeply involved in hedge funds like I once was, because I'm spending a lot of time on digital assets, we're in a different interest rate regime. Uh, and suddenly you get paid for shorting again. So I think we have a much higher probability that hedge funds are going to be really attractive going forward. Alpha generation, you know, companies can fail now, actually. Before, when there was free money, it was kind of hard to fail because it was just like, here's more money. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, we're in a very different environment. Arbitrage suddenly looks a lot more attractive. Um, but nevertheless, you know, hedge fund programs are now much more diversified. Uh, they're much more focused on like absolute return, trend following, global macro things that diversify your portfolio risk. Um, and so uh, a lot and a lot less long short. But, you know, there have been three, you know, real interest rate regimes in the time I've been investing. And I think hedge fund performance has generally followed uh, that. Um, and my interest in blockchain really was an outgrowth of having seen uh, all these different investment strategies and then understanding sort of how capital markets work, just seeing them from the inside and understanding that blockchain tech uh, could actually disrupt and disintermediate uh, the way we've we've sort of been doing business as a financial community for the last century. Mm. Well, I heard you say, and I think it was at a recent conference, that back in 2016, when you started looking at digital asset funds, that you couldn't find any. 
So it's an interesting time. So you you have this interest in this asset class that's growing very quickly. There's a there's a precedent in different parts of the world that's trying to come to the United States or at least develop in the United States. So can you share leading into 2016 what precipitated the the research and and how did that ideation process kind of take hold? Uh, so it was really a two stepper. Uh, first was the experience I had, you know, in the 1990s, sort of with we call it Web One now. We just called it the Internet back then. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, and that was that was a bit formative in that I could see how you know tech could suddenly transform, and it it was transformative and also highly disruptive. We created a new business model. K Zone was a totally new business model. We you know created games essentially, and people could learn to invest by playing these games. Um, and so I saw sort of how tech could really change people's lives for good and, you know, for bad, because some people were, I'm no doubt, addicted to the game. Um, And then you have the global financial crisis. And it's like, well, those two aren't really related. But in my experience, they were. Because suddenly I understood how uh, if people lose confidence in fiat currencies and the, the markets and governments, that this alternative thing called Bitcoin made a lot of sense. Uh, and so in 2013, when I ran across this article in The Economist about this thing called Bitcoin, I was like, wow, that's really interesting. And suddenly I was like, wait, we were doing distributed computing and distributed databases in the 1990s. We gamified investing in the 1990s. We disrupted an entire financial services industry with people being able to trade on their cell phones and over the, from their home laptop uh, and desktop. Uh, and now people are beginning to wonder, like, what's next? And so those two things just came together at this aha moment for me. I don't think I said aha, but you know, it was, some people do. I, it's I like okay. to think that I said aha, and you know, like the apple fell. <laughs> Hopefully, on my someone head, heard but, it. Yeah, um, no, I was just. I'm sure I was sitting, you know, eating breakfast or something, reading The Economist, um, and uh, then I started thinking about what this meant. Um, and having been invested in, in, you know, working with hedge funds for so long, I started to see how this tech could actually roll out and be disruptive more to like my business model and like what I was doing in financial services than sort of broader consumer applications. And that was because there was only Bitcoin back then and a couple of like crazy ideas. Um, and then in 2015, when the Ethereum white paper came out, I, I was like, wow, that's this is kind of interesting. And, and Ethereum, for those who don't know, it's think of it as like an operating system on your computer. It basically allows you to do a lot more things with your computer. Otherwise, your computer is just a box with a bunch of electronics. And you're like, well, that's you know, not very interesting, but Ethereum allowed uh, if it, you know, when it was fully developed, it would allow for a lot more interesting applications. We call them smart contracts, which are basically just sort of software that allows you to do more complicated things. And suddenly we went from having sort of like imagine a flip phone with limited things you could do with it to having an iPhone. And, you know, iPhones were 2008. We all forget that they weren't very long ago. Um, but uh, what I really realized at the time was that blockchain tech uh, could really reorganize um, society, but more importantly, businesses, uh, and uh, actually create um, opportunities for folks that didn't have any opportunities for you know, previously. Um, and if you had, a, for example, a fiat currency that was highly inflationary, then having something outside the control of your local government like Bitcoin is actually really good. Be- yeah. And I think I'm going to go on a little tangent here, but this is one of the challenges I think Americans have with understanding blockchain tech. And it's that, you know, our lives are relatively comfortable. We generally have faith in our system. Our currency is relatively stable. We think 5% inflation is like a crisis. No, no, no. 50% inflation is a crisis. And lots of the world has, you know, 50% inflation and they live with it every day. And so in the context of, you know, knowing that next year you're going to have half as much money as you had, because of inflation, or I could shield some of that in Bitcoin, which is priced in U.S. dollars. Bitcoin actually makes a lot of sense, mm-hmm. yeah. And and so, you know, stepping outside of the comfort zone of living in suburbia in the United States and thinking about the globe really changes your perspective on blockchain tech. And that's really what it did for me. And I'm sure having lived in Asia, it really helped. Since you got into it, what's been the uptake from institutions investing in blockchain type funds? Uh, it, it has been slow. Um, what's ironic is that if you have venture capital in your portfolio, you have 
blockchain tech because traditional VCs were investing in blockchain. So even folks who say, I don't want that. I'm like, well, you kind of already have it. Uh, and so that's one is just it's it's it was always there. It's been there. Um, some very famous VCs were investing in in um, blockchain companies back in like 2012, 13, 14 with Coinbase in its early rounds. Uh, and so blockchain tech has been in portfolios actually for a decade at this point for a lot of folks. Um, it's as far as like dedicated blockchain funds, um, you know, we've got a bias in favor of venture capital uh, structures. It's because the tech is so young and new, uh, but also um, we are much more interested in the tech and what it can mean for society uh, and business models uh, than we are in sort of like the liquid tokens and trading tokens, although, you know, so infrastructure is what you're right. Infrastructure, but also applications. Gotcha. Yeah. So basically, you know, all of the stuff that goes into uh, creating a, bus a new business model. And so it's everything from like the very base layer of infrastructure all the way through, you know, creating a really good user experience, which honestly, most blockchain tech is not, it's a bad user experience. Uh, and they're working on that, you know, very much so. But, um, you know, it has been slow in terms of institutional adoption. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, up to a third of institutions have some exposure, you know, in, in a dedicated way, right. mostly through venture. Um, interestingly enough, even though Bitcoin, you know, got a lot of, a lot of attention uh, over the last decade, it was the first, but also uh, it was the thing that hit 68,000 and people like big numbers. So it got a lot of institutional attention. Um, it actually, as far as direct holdings of Bitcoin, it's actually quite thin globally uh, in institutions. And when you think about, so what interests me is this, how about let's move just to the business question. How many businesses are, are starting to adopt and build applications? Because I heard one, you know, we could put all the ownership of real estate in the United States on the blockchain. Yep. I don't know. If, is, are things moving in that direction? They are, and and I'd say that you know, I was <laughs> I was talking with um, this is <laughs> uh, I do I've done at least a hundred if not 150 crypto 101 sessions with our clients where I basically just explain, you know, blockchain tech. And um, I was in one of these, this is during the, the COVID era, so it was by Zoom. And uh, one of the attendees, and he was the CFO of a, of a major US corporation. So he just gets up and walks out of the meeting. I was like, well, that, this didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then like 10 minutes later, he came in, he said, oh, I, you know, I was just, sorry, I was gone. I just, I was talking with our CEO, asking him what, you know, what our IT department was doing in terms of developing blockchain tech. And he said, everything we're doing is focused on blockchain tech. So I was glad that he left the room and came back. Um, <laughs> But it's actually quite broad and there's, but I'd say it's more like alpha and beta tests, like trying to figure out what uh, the applications potentially are and what it means. Um, and, you know, a blockchain tech is a, it's a fundamental transformative technology. And that means it's going to be a really bumpy road in terms of implementation. And so if you remember, uh, for those of you who are around, uh, in the 1990s, they introduced client server computing to companies. And everybody assumed that, well, if you went client server, suddenly you were going to have this massive uptake and, and there would be this huge improvement in productivity. And then what they realized is they had to retrain all the employees to work with the new tech. And that's exactly what's going to happen with blockchain. We can figure it out, but in the end, you're going to have to retrain your employees to work with this new technology. Uh, and we haven't gotten to that point yet. We have some beta tests. We have some applications that have been been out in corporate uh, structures where they are, for example, using it to manage accounts receivable or track, you know, turkeys or salad throughout the supply chain. Because when you find E. coli, you have to throw out everything that was potentially affected. Uh, but if you know exactly what turkeys went through, what part of the system that had the E. coli, then you only have to throw out those turkeys. So it's actually, you know, those sorts of applications have, have been have been underway in corporations for quite some time. You know, the United Nations has some tests. So it's it's one of these things where we're still, if we were in internet days, it's sort of 1996, 97, 98, where companies are like, well, there's this thing called the internet. We should probably try to figure it out. But right now, all you can really do is buy a book with it, um, you know, and maybe buy an airplane ticket. That was about what you could do, you know, back then. Yeah, it was in my high school library. I yeah. remember that was a big deal. Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah. But a client did invest. So in 2018, you have your first client who does invest. It sounds like there was a lot of education that went into that, not just to Guy's question, the institutional take up, but how about with your clients? So there are consultants that you also have to convince, I would assume as well, your colleagues 
Um, so that education process must have been interesting just from, uh, as you were saying, you, you, you wanted to be a teacher. So all yeah. of a sudden you're teaching yeah. again, you're teaching your colleagues, which is a different type of teaching experiment. Yes. So how, how was that process for you? Uh, it was, it, I had, it was tons of fun. It's still going on. Uh, you know, the, the tech changes every day, you know, it's, it's, it's the most engaged I've probably been, you know, with, with any form of technology, uh, in my entire career because something new happens every day. Uh, and so the education never stops, but the process really was twofold. Um, and one was one part of it was really creating sort of this arc of computing. Uh, and if you think about it, you know, we started with mainframes in the 40s and 50s, and then we introduced mini computers, which are just small mainframes, uh, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and then we had the introduction of uh, TCP IP, which is the basis of the internet, although to date, nobody's ever asked me how TCP IP works, but everybody asked me how Ethereum works. Um, so, uh, in, you know, we had the, we had, uh, TCP IP, which basically allowed us to create the local area network. And when we had the introduction of the personal computer in the eighties, then suddenly you had client server computing in the 1980s and 1990s. Then you had the introduction of the iPhone and cellular, uh, systems, broadly speaking. And suddenly everybody has sort of the internet in their pocket. But what that really means is we've gone from highly centralized computing steadily basically every decade or two to a more decentralized form of computing and we've been on this march for basically you know 70 years at this point and so it's pretty straightforward to assume that there will be another move to more decentralized computing from where we are today and so one is just that arc which is i think fairly compelling I don't know why it would suddenly stop with uh, cloud computing uh, and the iPhone, for example. Um, so I think it'll continue. And the next natural step in that arc is blockchain tech. So how do you see the relationship with decentralization and governance? Because the more you decentralize, the less oversight there is. Yes. The less oversight there is, the more nervous potentially institutional allocators can get or their consultants yep. with their fiduciary responsibility over their assets. Yeah. So how do you see that relationship between governance and decentralization? So uh, this is really fascinating because uh, while we're still trying to figure out governance on the blockchain, and there's been lots of different experiments, and we are very much in the experimental stage, the rules are actually pretty straightforward when they're well-written in the sense that you know, corporate governance took probably whatever, hundred years to get to the point where we are today. And then there was you know, obviously some regulation by the, the federal government in, in between. Um, and yet uh, in the case of blockchain tech, because it is all written into code, if somebody has translated the code into whatever language you're reading uh, really clearly, everybody knows how governance works. Now there can be bugs in the software and that's a perpetual problem with governance as well as blockchain tech. But if the rules are really clear and everybody understands how voting works and how the process of bringing something to a vote works is actually in some ways clearer than corporate structures. Because in blockchain tech, in most cases, anybody can pr promote, promote uh, an idea at any time, as opposed to waiting for the annual meeting and going through the whole proxy contest. Mm -hmm. um, but this means there's a lot of votes. Uh, and so what's going to be a challenge for uh, institutional investors is suddenly they're going to need to be much more engaged with the governance process if we eventually get to sort of a blockchain-based uh, world, which, mm -hmm. you know, still a TBD. But if we do, uh, suddenly, um, instead of having, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, a proxy advisor, advising you on how to vote your shares, you're going to have um, token advisors basically who will look at uh, and suggest. And then you might say, well, Robert really knows this protocol really well, so I'm actually going to allow him to vote my tokens. Mm. Uh, and so you actually see a, a very different structure uh, for governance going forward. But theoretically, it's more democratic than what we have today. Uh, Supermajority voting so far doesn't exist. You don't have class A and B shares in, in the case of, of tokens mm. at this point. And hope we don't get to that point. So at Drexel University for career development, I can talk about token advisors. That's the next yeah, job. That will be, yeah, maybe it might be five years, but yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. that's good. We never know. Well, it's interesting. So if you think about digital assets from an asset allocation perspective, um, I, 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 again, heard you say that it, it needs to be more than just a risk asset. It needs to be a diversifier. Do you see that happening as well within the next five years? Debatable. I think that's still an open question, uh, mostly because we are so early in the tech. And one of the challenges is that this is really like 1995, 96, 97 in terms of the internet. And so we have a long way to go before we end up with a lot of, um, you know, uh, attributes beyond sort of risk, uh, and that this is a growth asset. 
However, having said that, you know, because these are liquid assets in, in many cases and they're traded 24-7, 365, there is an enormous amount of data. And, and I, I think blockchain tech does not get enough credit for the amount of data that's available. So there's lots of pools of alpha, but there might be too much data, to be honest. Um, and so I think we might get to some points where hedge fund strategies, quantitative strategies actually can be designed in a way that they are diversifiers to the total portfolio. And you can create uncorrelated return streams. To date, things have been pretty correlated at this point. Interesting. Well, I did ask my students at Drexel to share a couple of questions because they're much more informed than me than I am. And I am on digital. I've learned a lot from this conversation, so I appreciate it. And I know Geet does as well. Um, one of the questions they ask is that investors are often told to zoom out when considering the short term volatility of their investments. In what ways might this apply or not apply to crypto? Uh, it is a fantastic way to think about crypto and and we're talking liquid crypto at this yeah. point i assume based on the question um you know short term volatility is extraordinarily high um this is you know, basically a 20 to 30 year technology trend just like the internet was um everyone forgets i mean i it was i was running a company at the time in the 1990s it it was crazy like the the day to day drama um in the internet in that era was extreme and now we have sort of the internet on steroids because it's traded 24/7 365 globally and before the internet was sort of siloed uh, and we were you know largely private markets at that point um so zooming out is really the way to think about it and if you think about this as a generational shift and generational trend you can stomach the short term volatility it's also good not to look at token pricing day to day um i have to but um i've i've kind of gotten numb to the, the volatility but you know think about bitcoin as an 80% standard deviation like what other thing in a, in a, in any portfolio has an 80% standard deviation and like <laughs> probably nothing mm -hmm. uh and it sometimes it's really correlated and sometimes it's not um, and what I remind people of is uh, if you think about Bitcoin at 80% standard deviation, you need to think about it from the perspective of market participants globally, not just, which goes back to my earlier comment, which, you know, if you think about it in the context of somebody who's living in an emerging market with high inflation or where the government likes to seize assets or where they are at risk of, of being invaded, um, suddenly having this thing that you can walk across a border with is incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. And that's an example of zooming out. You're just not zooming out from a market context. You're zooming out from sort of a life context. Um, and so from that perspective, uh, you yeah, know, there's lots of ways you can zoom out, but zooming out is great. The other thing I'd say uh, it, to think about uh, in terms of uh, liquid tokens, which, you know, do get a lot of news, um, is you are rewarded for buying low in this market more than you're, and you're actually penalized for buying high. Humans want to buy high. Like it's as a, as, as, as like a species, if we see a bull market, we're like, yeah, let's go. Let's, this is a great time. The worst possible time you can be investing in, in something is with an 80% standard v deviation mm -hmm. is at market highs because you know, within the next like six to 12 months, you're going to be at market lows. Um, and so what's funny to me is that, you know, humans want to buy Bitcoin at 55,000, but when it's 25, they're like, oh no, that's terrible. I don't want to own that. It's like, well, wait a second. You loved it at 55. Why don't you like marry it at, at 25? Um, and yet, you know, humans as a, as a species are like, no, 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 I want to wait for it to get really expensive. But in, in the case of, of, of crypto, because it runs at such a high standard deviation, you are rewarded for buying low. And that applies whether you're doing venture capital or whether you're doing liquid tokens. I think that's why we need independent risk managers, right? Even asset managers need somebody on the side to help them kind of discern when to buy or when not, when it's when there's too much risk on the table. So when you think about the risk management equation as it relates to your manager research role, have you seen risk management improvements, you know, from from your manager's perspective and have you have you been hearing from your clients that they're looking for, you know, more diligence, more risk management, more oversight as it relates to their investment? All right. So I'll take the second part and then we'll go to the managers. Um, well, we've, you know, we've been doing this for actually, this is our 50th anniversary this year. So we've been doing this for 50 years. So our process at this point is fairly well developed. Um, we've had lots of, we had 40 years of doing venture capital. So we follow the same process there. So nobody is really questioning that aspect of it because it's, it's been so thorough. Um, but the first part is, is actually a, a really high, um, uh, of high concern to me, especially. Um, and that's because, uh, we have a, basically a new asset class. I'm going to call it an asset class. It's in quotes, but it, it's, it's new for sure. Um, and one of the challenges is that suddenly you have, um, institutions, uh, the investment firms that we invest in, uh, are holding things that really don't look like anything they've ever held before. And so you will have venture capital firms suddenly holding 
within the space of two to three years, a significant portion of the portfolio that is liquid. Historically, venture capital firms do not hold liquid things, certainly not in size. And they actually have a, they typically like sell upon you know, something going liquid. In the case of, 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 of a private venture capital investment, it goes liquid within two to three years. Uh, and then there's still like three, four, five years of real high growth in, in front of it for that liquid token. And the venture firm is likely to hold it. They don't typically have risk management functions. And they all need risk management functions. If you're going to hold anything liquid, you need a risk management function. That is still being learned. And so when if somebody said, pick your favorite, uh, like come up with your ideal, uh, you know, uh, venture capital date, uh, it would be a venture capital firm that has all the things we expect out of a venture capital firm. And then they've brought in someone from who ran risk at a hedge fund who thinks about counterparty risk, who thinks about you know, reducing um, position size when it becomes too large, who's looking at all the on-chain data, and this is where you have to like have a lot of data analytics, who's looking at all the on-chain data to understand who the other holders are uh, and how they're behaving. And so I think we're going to get to that spot, but it's still pretty early. And I don't know that there's anybody that I would say has really nailed that formula yet. But there's a bunch of firms that are like getting close. Fred Wilson just came out with a post from USV talking about regulation and the increased regulation. And will that deter investment? And he said categorically, no, we'll be doubling down into right the fear of. So could you speak just a little about regulation of blockchain and what's going on? Maybe U.S. you described U.S. versus global. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, haven't, I, I did not read Fred's. Sorry, Fred, I didn't read your, your, <laughs> your, your post this morning. Um, I was preparing for this. Um, <laughs> I will, I promise, though. Um, <laughs> so, so there's it's sort of a tale of, of two cities at this point with uh, regulations, and it's basically the U.S. and then everybody else. Um, yeah, and, and obviously you can bring on somebody who's much more deep into regulation tech regulations uh, than I am, but uh, the U.S. is still trying to like develop a, a framework. We have uh, basically the rest of the world is is on its way to developing frameworks. Uh, which will attract capital uh, as well as the entrepreneurs that are building these these new companies and these new businesses um, because people will just go where the, the, the rules are clear, um, in my view. And so that may not be Cambridge's view, but that's my view. Um, so uh, the UK, Europe, Abu Dhabi, uh, Dubai, uh, UAE, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Japan have all announced major initiatives to come up with clear rules of the road when it comes to blockchain tech and crypto, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, France this week invited every U.S. blockchain entrepreneur to move to France. <laughs> so I've never seen a country like, like they do that kind of advertisement. So like, hey, you know, come to France. Uh, uh, if, you're, if you're feeling like, you know, the U.S. isn't, uh, you know, all hugs and kisses right now. And so, um, you know, Europe passed uh, 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 Mika. Uh, which is a, a major you know, step forward in clear, clearing up the rules there. So the EU will be operating within the next year under very, very clear rules. And all these other countries have basically said they're going to you know, come up with clear rules if they don't already have them. So, um, you know, you got the US, which is trying to figure things out. And then you've got all these other places that have said, we're you know, working on it or we've already come up with a solution. So I, I suspect that we'll see capital flows shift. Uh, in the first quarter, uh, I believe there was more venture capital committed to European uh, blockchain tech than the US, which is the first time ever. Uh, you know, uh, even just a couple of years ago, more than half of all blockchain developers were based in the US. It's now a minority of, of blockchain developers are based in the US. China announced um, two or three weeks ago that they wanted half a million uh, blockchain developers in, I forget what it was, number three, three years or something, like some, something which given the strength of China's um, tech uh, undergraduate programs is totally feasible. So we're seeing a very different story, you know, globally and different um, regulatory regimes are moving at different, different paces, but capital is global. Um, it will flow wherever it sees the best risk uh, adjusted returns. And so, uh, and blockchain, of course, is naturally global. It's like probably the first, uh, well, maybe the second, I guess you could say the internet's global, but it is probably the first tech that I would clearly say is, is 100% global. Bitcoin was from the very beginning a global um, tech uh, and blockchain itself is basically borderless. So from that perspective, I suspect we'll actually you know, see much more significant um, development happening in Asia, happening in Europe. Uh, and the U.S. Um, will continue to be, you know, a force, but uh, perhaps, you know, for until we get our regulations a bit clearer, it will be a diminished force mm -hmm. uh, in the development of blockchain tech. If you think about Cambridge Associates' definition of sustainability and sustainable investments, yeah. do digital assets fit 
in that definition? Uh, they do. Um, and uh, we think about it in like the ESG context, mm -hmm. um, you know, from a governance perspective, one token, one vote, like no super majority, mm -hmm. no blocking. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic, right? You just have to figure out how the voting works. But like, yeah, everybody can do that. And there'll be a token advisor that will do that for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so governance, super high. If you think about it from a societal perspective, it's utterly blind. And so a billionaire is treated the same as a farmer in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And that's really the first time in the history of mankind that it is truly blind. Like capital can truly be global and it can be uh, unimpeded by you know, any preferences or biases that people have. So that brings us to the E. Um, and that's this question of sustainability. And there it's really a split. Uh, there are, and this is, I'm, I don't want to get into the tech, but there's basically two ways of securing a blockchain. Uh, there is this thing called proof of work, which is what Bitcoin uses, which requires an enormous amount mm -hmm. of computational power and electricity to secure the blockchain network. And you might say, well, that's not a good business model. It's never been hacked. It's never been you know, broken. It's never, nothing's ever been stolen from the Bitcoin network itself. There have been hacks associated with you know, the, the parties that hold Bitcoin, that kind of thing. But the Bitcoin network itself has never been hacked. Name a major corporation or major government spy agency that has never been hacked. Globally, like they've all been hacked, right? And yet here's this thing, Bitcoin, which just uses a lot of computing power and a lot of electricity to ensure the integrity of the system. And at one point, you know, there was well over a trillion dollars on the Bitcoin network. And if something was going to get hacked, a trillion dollars would totally get hacked. So proof of work makes a lot of sense. And in the context of uh, people that are holding Bitcoin, that are living in, in places that are unstable, they want that security. And if, if it allows you to flee an invasion and pick up your life, that matters to you a lot more. That security matters a lot more to you than than electricity consumption. Now, the cost of the planet is is clearly there. Uh, in the United States, uh, Bitcoin mining is heavily in, uh, based on solar and wind um, and renewables. Other places in the world, not so much. So we need to fix that. Uh, but uh, that's proof of work, which is very secure, but obviously electricity intense. And then you have this other thing, proof of stake, which is basically I put up capital to help secure the network. Uh, if I uh, if I fail in my job of helping to secure the network, I lose some of my capital. So that's a big incentive to not making a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, and proof of stake is is massively uh, electricity, um, is a massive electricity savings over proof of work, mm -hmm. like 99.9% more efficient in electricity. So you have two different ways of doing it. Um, so the E, you know, it kind of depends on your perspective. Uh, but most new tech that's under development has gone to proof of stake, not proof of work. And I think at one point, maybe only Bitcoin will be proof of work, but it's functioning and its role in the world is fundamentally different than everything else, which is really designed around new business models. And Bitcoin is really this sort of uh, last resort uh, asset that, that people are going to hold uh, if they lose confidence, fiat currencies, or they live in a place where they can't trust their, their fiat currency. Really interesting. I'm getting worried that you don't get many breaks. Are you doing this all alone? Who is that? Tell us about your team from a manager research perspective. So, uh, you know, Cambridge has about 150 people in manager research. So we're very well staffed and resourced. Uh, and blockchain um, is something that everybody wants to, to learn about. So I have a couple of folks that I work with very, very closely. Um, one and, and the two, uh, that I work most closely with are a little bit younger than me, uh, who have sort of grown up, uh, in this new digital world. Um, and then, although I can remind them that I learned to program in basic and they're like, what the hell is, you know, like, what? so, so I, yeah, there is, there are advantages to age because you could actually, you know, look at trends over long periods of time and pattern match. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, one is, is super deep into the tech and has a, you know, a very high percentage of his personal net worth in decentralized finance. And he understands programming and he understands the blockchain tech and he knows tons of people. So he's like my tech resource. So I was like, I don't understand this. You, you figure this out. Like, what do you think? And then he'll tell me what he thinks. And so that's, that's, you know, one of my go-to people. And then there's another, uh, a uh, person who is just phenomenal doing um, venture DDs. And he, he, he's just amazing at doing manager research. So those are the two core people. And then there's a half dozen other associates that help me whenever they have time on diligences. Uh, and what's kind of interesting about blockchain is because it's new and everybody's trying to learn about it, I have investment directors, managing directors, other partners doing diligence work as well because they want to learn about the tech. And so it's it's like a rotating cast of like, you know, basically 15 people. Um, so I'm mean, probably the best resource, you know, person in blockchain research, you know, on the planet at this point because everybody wants to learn about it. We uh, have a bias in favor of, of tech, uh, which would basically be venture, whether it's early stage or late stage. I, the bias to date has been much more in favor of seed and early stage because valuations are most attractive at that point. Um, 
there are clients that have exposure to later stage crypto um, venture structures. Um, we don't. I mean, all of crypto is basically venture at this point. So like we might call it late stage, but it's basically all venture. It's just later stage venture than the early stage. Uh, and uh, that's been the, the heavy preponderance of assets that have been deployed, uh, have been into the, the lockup structures, the, gotcha. the, the eight to 12 year life funds. And then we have some folks that have done hedge funds, but realistically the hedge funds are also doing venture at this point. They're just in the hedge fund structure. Uh, a few uh, institutions that have done, um, you know, long only uh, index funds, whether it's Bitcoin or ETH, um, and then a, a handful that might hold it directly. Uh, but up until really like the last two years, holding Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything directly was really, really hard. And so most folks would opt for a fund wrapper you know, at that point. I'm just curious, what are some of the characteristics you're now looking for? I mean, there are common characteristics we think about with hedge fund managers or long only managers, uh, whether it's quality, concentration, I mean, there are a number of factors. It's a new asset class. It's alternatives primarily, as you just described. So what types of characteristics are you looking for in those managers? If an asset manager is listening and saying, okay, I'm the type of manager that fits you know, that category based on what Joe just described. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the emails and the LinkedIn's are going to hit, you know, hit, hit, hit uh, Joe, they, uh, yeah, as soon as they are going next. So I mean, <laughs> think very carefully, like I'll create as tight of a funnel as possible. Okay. No, actually I, I try, I try to talk to everybody that, that reaches out cause you never know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a good approach. So, uh, the things that don't apply geography. So we don't segregate you know, blockchain and digital assets into Asia versus US or developed versus Europe. Like none of that exists because it's all global. So we don't actually care about that. So. You know, uh, it's it's a global op market opportunity. The TAM is global. Uh, the total, total total addressable market is global. Um, and it's kind of funny when people talk TAM. You're like, well, you know, there's eight billion people on the planet. That's kind of the TAM. Um, but nevertheless, we can get into more refined you know, measures there. So global. Uh, so geography doesn't matter. Um, stage of investing really matters to us. Like, where are they investing in the ecosystem? You know, I find it's easier to slot very specific strategies. Uh, into portfolios. So if someone says, I, I, if it's a venture fund and we do pre-seed and seed and series A investing, that's a defined category and you can put it into a portfolio because you know exactly what they're going to be doing. Um, and those are great for clients and client teams uh, and other folks uh, that are trying to build out a diversified portfolio because you really want to know exactly what you own so you can add other things that are going to be complementary. Um, when you're doing pre-seed and seed and series A investing, Asset size really matters. How much money you have under management is critical. Uh, and that's because blockchain tech is really uh, capital efficient. Sometimes there's nothing beyond a C round. Sometimes there's nothing beyond a, or beyond a series A. And then there are other businesses that are really growing significantly and they have to you know, do advertising and they have to build a consumer base. And so they might actually have later stage rounds. Uh, but if you are doing seed stage and early stage investing, um, size really matters. Um, you know, rounds are, you know, a few million dollars, $15 million, you know, a $50 million raise is a big deal in crypto. So you can imagine how fund size matters, uh, when there's not more than a couple of raises, if, if more than one. Um, and so we're really sensitive to fund size. Uh, that's critical to us. Um, liquid tokens is a little bit different, uh, very different actually. But, uh, then it comes down to really the team and how long have they been in the space? How um, well known are they? What is their personal network? And I can't overemphasize, and this is one of the big differences in the, I think in diligence um, between traditional um, diligence process and blockchain diligence process, um, which is reputation is everything. And you might say, well, that kind of applies to everything. However, uh, and every asset class, but in the case of, of venture capital in particular, the reputation of the venture capital firm uh, because it's a global network and everybody talks to everybody else, uh, goes very, very fast out across this network. And so when I'm doing reference checks, what the entrepreneurs think of the venture capital firms that back them is critical. And these entrepreneurs, they, they're very honest, I guess I'd say they're engineers, mm -hmm. you know, they have no filters. They tell you exactly what they think. Um, and it's wonderful. Um, you know, you talk to sort of like a growth, like a traditional growth stage PE uh, reference check. And it's like the CEO who's probably been a CEO of several companies now and they're really polished. And you're basically trying to like wordsmith uh, everything they're saying and you're looking at their body language. and You're like, well, was that a compliment or was that actually a negative? I'm still not entirely sure. But in the case of an engineer, they'll be like, no, they were terrible. You're like, oh, okay, well, thanks. That makes it really easy. Why were they terrible? And then they tell you why they're terrible. And then you might say, and... 
then you ask like, well, did you tell other people? He's like, oh yeah, I told all my friends never to work with that venture capital firm ever again. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, that, that, and that gets basically broadcast out across, you know, the entire entrepreneurial network. And so uh, reference checks are actually really different in, in the space. And so I do a lot more of them um, and they're fun to, too, uh, but they will oftentimes talk about all the venture funds that they chose not to go with and why. And so you, you have very honest conversations with engineers that you might not have with like a really polished CEO. Um, and since that reference uh, is what other entrepreneurs would use to decide what venture capital firm they're going to accept as their, you know, investors, uh, it has a huge impact. So like that is hands down the most significant difference uh, in the uh, process. So if you're a venture capital fund out there and you don't support your entrepreneurs, you probably shouldn't talk with me because I'm basically going to find out right away. Um, but if you spend a lot of time helping your entrepreneurs build their businesses, um, then you're going to be getting you know great deal flow going forward. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. And thank you for taking that risk of uh, giving those insights into our audience. You probably will get a few calls, but I, I, I promise they'll be informed. Um, well, you are joining me at Drexel University after this conversation. You're going to be speaking to engineers and entrepreneurs. Uh, so maybe a quick preview for our audience. What's the type of advice that you would give students, third year, fourth year undergraduates, uh, one of whom is actually in the studio with us right now, Dimitri. So as, as you're thinking about advice Given everything we just talked about, there's a lot of change going on. It's global. Uh, it's decentralized. There are a lot of moving parts. It takes a lot of education. It takes a good reputation. So what's the type of advice that you're giving you know, younger people that are coming into this, this world? Um, well, they have an inherent advantage because they've, they've lived in the digital world. And this um, Generation Alpha, the one that's coming up, they're going to think differently than everybody else because they will be living in an AI-driven world. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think that having that is, is, is one, a prerequisite to working in a blockchain you know, world. Um, but you really need to start experimenting and exploring how blockchain tech is used in day-to-day in -day life. And it's a really bad experience in generally right now, but nevertheless, you need to figure it out. Um, and so you need to start experimenting with decentralized finance platforms. Um, this doesn't require immense amount of capital, but you still need to like understand how it works. Um, you should be on some of the new social media platforms that are out there, understanding how they work. Um, you want to understand uh, like what is a good user experience and a bad user experience. And that is sort of the defining um, moment for blockchain tech is that right now it's generally a, a poor user experience. So we have to get past that. Um, if it is an iPhone as easy to use as your iPhone, it's not going to become a global TAM. Mm -hmm. It will remain the, the domain of a bunch of engineers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and then it comes to the question of programming. And so obviously having some understanding of programming, uh, is going to be quite helpful. Um, especially, you know, a place like Drexel, they all understand that. Um, but it's beyond that, uh, because blockchain tech is all about, um, incentive structures. It's how do you uh, get, uh, build a market, uh, and a group of consumers or users. And you do that through token design, through incentivization structures, uh, which basically relies upon economics and, and behavioral, uh, finance theories. Uh, and then you might as well be participating in the governance platform and process as well. And there's lots of like every, every, you know, token has a governance uh, structure. So there's lots of different ways to experiment there. Mm -hmm. But you really need to get as broad of an experience as possible while you still, um, you know, have uh, a couple of years to really decide what you want to do. Because once you enter that that world, uh, you're probably going to be specializing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you might find that you're, you're focused on cryptography or you might find that you're focused on token design. You might be wanting to work with a venture capital firm and then you need all of the above. So, um, getting as broad of an experience as possible. And if you find something you love, go deep into it because that basically sets your career path going forward. And if it's cryptography, it's cryptography. Um, and if it's, it's figuring out like great user experiences, then, you know, figure that out because quite frankly, the user experience is, is quite terrible at this point. Who are the people who've helped you along the way? So if you think about your team outside of your colleagues, you know, who are the mentors who have helped guide you through a lot of our students are looking for mentors right now. It's in, I'm sure a lot of your sons are looking for mentors. They've got teammates and I should plug Guy's sons. They're about to play in the final four lacrosse final four, Penn state in coming Philly. up yeah, in Saturday. Philadelphia. So, but as, as you think about mentors uh, for yourself, you know, who, who, who helped you along? I guess I, there were two types of mentors that really helped me. Um, the, the ones that you really want to find, uh, and, and these were the ones I, I, honestly worked with, but 
and I tried to replicate this, which may or may not be frustrating to the people that work for me, um, which essentially is here's a problem, go solve it. And you're like, okay, anything else? Like, no, no, just go solve it. And, and because it basically, cre you create your own thought processes and you have to figure out things for yourself. And then once you figure it out, it's kind of like, you know, you can give somebody a fish or you can teach them to fish, that kind of thing. Right. And so um, my brain is much more like, okay, great. I'll come up with my own solution. And then I, of course, you know, chastise myself when I don't think it's like the great, the right solution there or it could be done better. And then I try to improve. So uh, if you have an improvement mentality and you always want to be better then then those are the people that you need to really to find. At the same time, I happened prior to Cambridge, I worked for a couple of people who I would, they were, I guess, positive, negative influences in the sense that um, they taught me how not to treat people. Uh, and uh, yeah, you, you basically have to get away from them as quickly as you can. Um, but once you've been on the receiving end of those types of behaviors, you realize you don't ever want to do that to somebody else. And so I learned very quickly you know, this is not how to behave to another human being. Um, and while that was a, a harsh and, and fortunately brief lesson, uh, it was, you know, the, this Japanese gentleman way back in, you know, my first job out of school who basically said uh, to me, you know, go figure this out. And I did. Um, wasn't the smoothest process, but those are the types of those mentors that are great. Um, I think the, the back then it was a lot harder to connect with people. Um, now you can find people on LinkedIn or you can find them through social media and people are much more willing to share their time. So there's a whole range of opportunities that are open for mentorship now that didn't exist mm -hmm. uh, back in, you know, when I was going through it. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here today. Congratulations on all your success. Mm -hmm. This was a very interesting conversation. Uh, we appreciate your time, Guy. We appreciate your time That's as thanks. well being here. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, no, it was great. It was great. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. So if you want to learn more about Joe and Cambridge Associates, please visit their website at www.cambridgeassociates.com. You can find this episode and past episodes on Spotify, Apple, Google, or your favorite podcast platform. We are also available on YouTube if you prefer to watch while you listen. If you want to catch up on past episodes, check out our website at dakota.com. Finally, if you like what you're seeing and hearing, please be sure to like, follow, and share these episodes. We welcome your feedback as well. Joe, thanks for being here. Guy, as well. And thank you to our audience. Don't say goodbye.